Chapter 25 In Balquida At the door of the first house we came to, Alan knocked, which was of no very safe enterprise in such a part of the highlands as the Braes of Balquida. No great clan held rule there. It was filled and disputed by small septs and broken remnants and what they called chiefless folk, driven into the wild country about the springs of Forth and Teeth by the advance of the Campbells. Here were Stuarts and McLarens, which came to the same thing, for the McLarens followed Alan's chief in war, and made but one clan with Appen. Here too were many of that old, proscribed, nameless, red-headed clan of the McGregors. They had always been ill-considered, and now worse than ever, having credit with no side or party in the whole country of Scotland. Their chief, McGregor of McGregor, was an exile. The more immediate leader of that part of them about Balquidder, James Moore, Rob Roy's eldest son, lay waiting his trial in Edinburgh Castle. They were in ill blood with Highlander and Lowlander, with the Grahams, the McLarens and the Stuarts, and Alan, who took up the quarrel of any friend, however distant, was extremely wishful to avoid them. Chance served us very well, for it was a household of McLarens that we found, where Alan was not only welcome for his namesake, but known by reputation. Here then I was got to bed without delay, and a doctor fetched, who found me in a sorry plight, but whether because he was a very good doctor, or I a very young, strong man, I lay bedridden for no more than a week, and before a month I was able to take the road again with a good heart. All this time Alan would not leave me, though I often pressed him, and indeed his foolhardiness in staying was a common subject of outcry with the two or three friends that were let into the secret. He hid by day in a hole of the braes under a little wood, and at night, when the coast was clear, would come into the house to visit me. I need not say if I was pleased to see him. Mrs. McLaren, our hostess, thought nothing good enough for such a guest, and as Duncan Do, who was the name of our host, had a pair of pipes in his house, and was much a lover of music, this time of my recovery was quite a festival, and we commonly turned night into day. The soldiers let us be, although once a party of two companies and some dragoons went by in the bottom of the valley, where I could see them through the window as I lay in bed. What was much more astonishing... No magistrate came near me, and there was no question put of whence I came or whither I was going, and in that time of excitement I was as free of all inquiry as though I had lain in a desert. Yet my presence was known before I left to all the people in Balquida and the adjacent parts, many coming about the house on visits, and these, after the custom of the country, spreading the news among their neighbours. The bills, too, had now been printed. There was one pinned near the foot of my bed, where I could read my own not very flattering portrait, and in larger characters the amount of the blood money that had been set upon my life. Duncan Dew and the rest that knew that I had come there in Alan's company could have entertained no doubt of who I was, and many others must have had their guess. For though I had changed my clothes, I could not change my age or person, and lowland boys of eighteen were not so rife in these parts of the world, and above all about that time that they could fail to put one thing with another and connect me with the bill. So it was, at least. Other folk keep a secret among two or three near friends, and somehow it leaks out. But among these clansmen, it is told to a whole countryside, and they will keep it for a century. There was but one thing happened worth narrating, and that is the visit I had of Robin Oig, one of the sons of the notorious Rob Roy. He was sought upon all sides on a charge of carrying a young woman from Balfron, and marrying her, as was alleged, by force. Yet he stepped about Balquidder like a gentleman in his own walled policy. It was he who had shot James McLaren at the plough stilts, a quarrel never satisfied, yet he walked into the house of his blood enemies as a rider might into a public inn. Duncan had time to pass me word of who it was, and we looked at one another in concern. You should understand, it was then close upon the time of Alan's coming. The two were little likely to agree, and yet if we sent word or sought to make a signal, it was sure to arouse suspicion in a man under so dark a cloud as the MacGregor. He came in with a great show of civility, but like a man among inferiors, took off his bonnet to Mrs. McLaren, but clapped it on his head again to speak to Duncan, and having thus set himself, as he would have thought, in a proper light, came to my bedside and bowed. I am given to know, sir, says he, that your name is Balfour. They call me David Balfour, said I, at your service. I would give ye my name in return, sir, he replied, but it's one somewhat blown upon of late days, and it'll perhaps suffice if I tell ye that I am my own brother to James Moore Drummond, or MacGregor, 
of whom ye will scarce have failed to hear. No, sir, said I, a little alarmed, nor yet of your father, MacGregor Campbell, and I sat up and bowed in bed, for I thought best to compliment him, in case he was proud of having had an outlaw to his father. He bowed in return. But what I am come to say, sir, he went on, is this. In the year 45, my brother raised a part of the Gregara and marched six companies to strike a stroke for the good side, and the surgeon that marched with our clan and cured my brother's leg when it was broken in the brush at Preston Pans was a gentleman of the same name precisely as yourself. He was brother to Balfour of Baith, and if you are in any reasonable degree of nearness one of that gentleman's kin, I have come to put myself and my people at your command. You are to remember that I knew no more of my descent than any cadger's dog. My uncle, to be sure, had prated of some of our high connections, but nothing to the present purpose, and there was nothing left me but that bitter disgrace of owning that I could not tell. Robin told me shortly he was sorry he had put himself about, turned his back upon me without a sign of salutation, and as he went towards the door, I could hear him telling Duncan that I was only some kinless loon that didn't know his own father. Angry as I was at these words, and ashamed of my own ignorance, I could scarce keep from smiling that a man who was under the lash of the law, and was indeed hanged some three years later, should be so nice as to the descent of his acquaintances. Just in the door he met Alan coming in, and the two drew back and looked at each other like strange dogs. They were neither of them big men, but they seemed fairly to swell out with pride. Each wore a sword, and by a movement of his haunch, thrust clear the hilt of it, so that it might be the more readily grasped and the blade drawn. Mr. Stewart, I am thinking, says Robin. Troth, Mr. MacGregor, is not a name to be ashamed of, answered Alan. I did not know ye were in my country, sir, says Alan. It sticks in my mind that I am in the country of my friends the MacLarens, says Alan. That's a kittle point, returned the other. There may be two words to say to that, but I think I will have heard that you are a man of your sword. Unless you were born deaf, Mr. MacGregor, you will have heard a good deal more than that, says Alan. I am not the only man that can draw steel in Appen, and when my kinsman and captain Archiel had a talk with a gentleman of your name not so many years back, I could never hear that the MacGregor had the best of it. Do ye me my father, sir? says Robin. Well, I would nay wonder, said Alan. The gentleman I have in mind had the ill taste to clap Campbell to his name. My father was an old man, returned Robin. The match was unequal. You and me would make a better pair, sir. I was thinking that, said Alan. I was half out of bed, and Duncan had been hanging at the elbow of these fighting cocks, ready to intervene upon the least occasion. But when that word was uttered, it was a case of now or never, and Duncan with something of a white face to be sure, thrust himself between. Gentlemen, said he, I will have been thinking of a very different matter whatever. Here are my pipes, and here are you two gentlemen who are both acclaimed pipers. It's an old dispute which one of ye's the best. Here will be a broad chance to settle it. Why, sir, said Alan, still addressing Robin, from whom indeed he had not so much as shifted his eyes, nor yet Robin from him. Why, sir, said Alan, I think I will have heard some sow of the sort. Have ye music, as folk say? Are ye a bit of a piper? I can pipe like a McCrimmon, cries Robin. And that is a very bold word, quoth Alan. I have made bolder words good before now, returned Robin, and that against better adversaries. It is easy to try that, says Alan. Duncan Dhu made haste to bring out the pair of pipes that was his principal possession, and to set before his guests a mutton ham and a bottle of that drink which they call the Athel Bros, and which is made of old whisky, strained honey, and sweet cream, slowly beaten together in the right order and proportion. The two enemies were still on the very breach of a quarrel, but down they sat, one upon each side of the peat fire, with a mighty show of politeness. McLaren pressed them to taste his mutton ham and the wife's brose, reminding them the wife was out of Athol and had a name far and wide for her skill in that confection. But Robin put aside these hospitalities as bad for the breath. I would have ye to remark, sir, said Alan, that I have nay broken bread for near upon ten hours, which will be worse for the breath than any brose in Scotland. I will take no advantages, Mr. Stewart, replied Robin. Eat and drink, I'll follow you. Each ate a small portion of the ham and drank a glass of the brose to Mrs. McLaren, and then, after a great number of civilities, Robin took the pipes and played a little spring in a very ranting manner. Aye, ye can blow, said Alan, 
and taking the instrument from his rival, he first played the same spring in a manner identical with Robin's, and then wandered into variations, which, as he went on, he decorated with a perfect flight of grace notes, such as Piper's Love and Call the Warblers. I had been pleased with Robin's playing. Allen's ravished me. That's no very bad, Mr. Stewart, said the rival, but ye show a poor device on your warblers. Me, cried Allen, the blood starting to his face. I give ye the lie. Do ye own yourself beaten at the pipes then, said Robin, that ye seek to change them for the sword. And that's very well said, Mr. McGregor, returned Allen, and in the meantime, laying a strong accent on the word, I take back the lie, I appeal to Duncan. Indeed, ye need appeal to nabody, said Robin. Ye are a far better judge than any McLaren in Balquidder, for it's a God's truth that you are a very creditable piper for a steward. Hand me the pipes. Alan did as he asked, and Robin proceeded to imitate and correct some part of Alan's variations, which it seemed that he remembered perfectly. Aye, ye have music, said Alan gloomily. And now be the judge yourself, Mr. Stewart, said Robin, and taking up the variations from the beginning, he worked them throughout to so new a purpose, with such ingenuity and sentiment, and with so odd a fancy and so quick a knack in the grace notes, that I was amazed to hear him. As for Alan, his face grew dark and hot, and he sat and gnawed his fingers, like a man under some deep affront. Enough, he cried. Ye can blow the pipes, make the most of that, and he made as if to rise. But Robin only held out his hand as if to ask for silence, and struck into the slow measure of the pibroch. It was a fine piece of music in itself, and nobly played, but it seems besides it was a piece peculiar to the Appen Stuarts, and a chief favourite with Alan. The first notes were scarce out, before there came a change in his face. When the time quickened, he seemed to grow restless in his seat, and long before that piece was at an end, the last signs of his anger died from him, and he had no thought but for the music. Robin Oig, he said, when it was done, ye are a great piper, I am not fit to blow in the same kingdom with ye. Body of me, ye have mere music in your sparring than I have in my head, and though it still sticks in my mind that I could maybe show ye another of it with the cold steel, I warn ye beforehand, it'll no be fair. It would go against my heart to haggle a man that can blow the pipes as you can. Thereupon that quarrel was made up. All night long the bros was going, and the pipes changing hands, and the day had come pretty bright, and the three men were none the better for what they had been taking, before Robin as much as thought upon the road.